This is an apple. This is an apple. This apple has seeds inside of it. We're all aware of that, right? Apple has seeds inside of it. So this apple, did you know that the seeds inside of this apple have the ability to produce more apples? Did you know that you can actually take seeds from an apple, just a regular, ordinary, garden-style apple, (laughs) and you can use these seeds to grow apple trees and produce more apples? Did you know... That in order to do that, this apple is going to have to give up its life. Because the seeds are inside. And so it's going to have to sacrifice. Because I can't magically get the seeds out. And in fact, anything I do to try to get the seeds out is going to sacrifice the apple. Did you know that the apple seeds, once I get them out, you can't just throw them in the ground? That there is a long process to germinating the seeds in order to grow apples. It's a pretty intense and long process. And there's stuff you have to do. And you have to do it right. There's stuff that you have to do in order for those seeds to produce more seeds. And did you know that once those seeds, you do what you're supposed to do. And there's some big fancy words in germinating them. And once you do all of that and put them in all the right conditions. Did you know when you put them in the ground, how long it will take before fruit is produced? Six to ten years. Six to ten years before there will be fruit. I want you to remember this apple. This is an apple, and it has the ability to produce after its own kind. We're going to end with that today, but for now, I just want you to see. This, my wife tells me this is a Granny Smith apple. I didn't even know I had a Granny Smith, but this was Granny Smith's apple, I guess, she told me. Thank you for that laughter. I thought it was a dumb joke as I was saying it, and y'all still laughed. Thank you. It was a dumb joke. Thank you. Thank you so much. Front row. It's so good to have my kids on the front row to tell me when I'm dumb. Praise God. So today we're going to look at discipleship again. We're looking at groupies. We're looking at discipleship and how it's best done life on life. Now, I want to remind you of our our, uh, overall arcing theme for the year. Our theme is the Isaiah 61 mandate, and that is the restoration of hearts and homes. And so I want to talk about how discipleship and what we're looking at today fits in to the restoration of hearts and homes, because it is so important that all of us find restoration for our own lives and in our own lives so that we can do what God's called us to do, so that we can be who God has created us to be. And so this that we're looking at today, this life on life discipleship is a very important part of um, the Isaiah 61 mandate. So let's start with Colossians chapter three. We're looking at Colossians chapter three, verses 12 through 16. Colossians 3, 12 through 16 says this, put on then as God's chosen ones. That's you. You're God's chosen ones. Holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against each other, another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. That's a big mouthful right there, isn't it? Forgiving others the same way Christ has forgiven us. And above all, Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, there is so much in the scripture to to look at. But we're not even going to take the time to dig it all out for the sake of discipleship. We're looking at how this applies. This scripture applies to our one-on-one relationships. I have come to truly believe that discipleship is best done in the context of life on life. Not in a sermon, not in a classroom, not even in small group setting. I have found through our lives and through my life personally, I can tell you that I have found discipleship takes, bla- takes, pace, takes place best in one-on-one relationships. Yeah, okay. It is in the one-on-one relationships when you get to know somebody that you really get to see how they are living out the love of God, how they are living the word. You know, I I believe in preaching. I believe in church. I believe in us coming together. I believe in teaching. I love to teach the word of God. But I know this. 
You have had so many sermons that you heard and you said on the way out the door, uh, Pastor, I, I need to work on that. That's good. That's good. But then life happens and the next week there's another sermon. And you're like, oh, that was a good one, Pastor. I really need to work on that. And before you know it, you've got 10 or 12 things you're really supposed to work on and none of it is happening, right? And then pastor goes back to a sermon and preaches the same sermon. And somebody says, you preached that before. And people say, when are you going to preach something new? And pastors say, if they are honest, stuff like, when you start doing the things I preached the first time. Right? Right? I mean, most of them won't say that, but I will. <laughs> right? Because, because we need to hear it. And I'm not saying it doesn't need to be taught over and over. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there is so much. I read this week a guy said that there, we are probably about 3,000 scriptures deep in things that we've learned that we haven't yet started doing. I mean, we just read, there's so much, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I could spend a month conquering some of those things, forgiving as Christ forgave me. That's complete. It, can everybody in this room tell me you ain't hold nothing against nobody? Nothing? Or is there a little something every now and then? So I, I realize that we have to work to live these things out. And so it's more than just coming and hearing sermons. It's taking what you've learned and figuring out how do I apply this? How do I leave this out? James says for us to be hearers of the word and not doers, we deceive ourselves. And I've run into so many Christians who are so deceived into thinking they're spiritual. And brothers, let me tell you something. If you can't forgive another person, your spirituality is worthless. If you can't walk in love... And so it's not just hearing... But it's living out. So I believe discipleship is all about learning how to live these things out. And I believe that's best one-on-one. -on -one. So let's look at what we talked about last week. What is a disciple? It's someone who follows Jesus, is learning to live like Jesus, love like Jesus. We want to love like Jesus loved. We want to uh, reveal Father's love and then leave behind what Jesus left behind. So a disciple and just, this, just my opinion in this is what we're looking at is someone who's following Jesus. I've chosen. I have decided to follow Jesus. Okay, what does that mean? That means I'm learning to live like Jesus. That means I'm not just asking WWJD, hey, come on. but I'm looking to see how would Jesus respond in this? How do I feel Jesus inside of me wanting to respond in this? What does the word say? About this, learning to live that way and then reveal father's love. That's what Jesus came to do to reveal the father's love. So if I'm going to be like Jesus, I'm going to be seeking to love to the depth he loved. You know, there were times when it looked like Jesus compromised. I mean, you have to look deeply to understand he broke spiritual laws. The Bible says you ought not do this. And Jesus says, oh, wait, there's way more than that. How about the woman thrown in adultery? There was a rule. There was a law. There was something that should have been done. She should have been stoned according to the law. And Jesus said, not ignore the law. He says, live by a higher law. There's a greater law, he says. And the greater law is the one I told you that is bigger than all of them. That makes all of them work together. You just want to kill her to get this away from you. But the truth is, the only way she's going to ever get out of that sin is somebody to love her the way God loves us all. And it's, it's difficult because in the church, we want to, you know, we have this little thing where we say, uh, hate the sin and love the sinner. But I don't think we know how to do that very well. I don't even think we know what that means. And I think if we're not careful, we just come up with a doctrine of hate. We have to love the way Jesus loved. That means that there will be times when you love people, where you accept people. How about Jesus saying to Zacchaeus, Jesus was not supposed to eat with Zacchaeus. He wasn't even supposed to commute. This man had no rights to rabbi Jesus. And Jesus says, come down. I'm going to your house. That's why they said he even eats with sinners and, and Republicans. <laughs> he even eats with Democrats. 
He even eats with liberals. Sometimes it looked like compromise, but there was never compromise in Jesus. All he did was love. I'm telling you, to some people, it would look like Jesus compromised to even accept you into the kingdom. But there was never compromise. It was just love. It was love because he knew he knows he knows your end and your beginning. In the middle of the story, he ain't sweating it. All right, Jesus, help me move on. We're told to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly here. We're told to teach and admonish one another. Do you know that is the only scriptural reference? There are two places where this is put, to, and it's uh, New Thesis or New Theo. It's biblical counseling. There are only two places in the Bible where we're instructed to biblically counsel one another like that. And did you know it's not written to pastors and it's not written to ministers? It's written to the church. To the church at large, he says, I want you to instruct one another. I want you to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, hear what he says. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you biblically counsel and instruct one another. New Thesis, New Theo, this, this letting the word of God live in you so richly that you're able to help others know what the Bible says about situations. He, and he says it interesting. He says through songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. We are to biblically counsel one another with our songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. As you help one another grow in the Lord, that means that biblical counseling is not a mandate for just a few people, but it's a responsibility for all of us. Maybe you've never heard that before, but I need you to understand, you have just as much right and responsibility to be counseling other people as anyone else does. Now, here's the problem. Many times church folk will say, like some of you are saying right now, I don't know nothing about counseling nobody. I can't counsel nobody. How could I counsel anybody in the word? Well, you can only do that if you do the first part first. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Because if you're not letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, you will never be able to counsel anyone because you don't know what the word says. So when somebody comes and says, I'm having a problem, your friend that you're in a a relationship with, and he says, man, I'm really going through this, you'll be like, oh, man, that's that's bad. You ought to come to my church. My pastor preached about that before you come hear him preach. That's all you got? But when, when the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly and your friend says, man, I'm really struggling, I'm going through something, and you think, oh, dude, I just read a scripture about this. Really? Yeah, yeah. Here's what it says. Here's what I've learned. Here's what, man, I went through that too. And here's what I learned through that. Because you're taking your experiences, your life, and life on life, you begin to help somebody else. So I believe that there are very practical ways we can help. So I want to talk for just a minute about practical ways I have learned that discipleship works. First, it's best done life on life. Best done life on life. That means as I walk through life and you get to see the real me, you get to See what I really act like. And you don't just get to see the me I want you to see. You see, in church, I mean, we, 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 we let people see the, the, the us that we want them to see. All of you, not just me. You all, we all do it. I mean, you didn't roll up here cussing and hollering and catawalling today. But there might have been a time this week you were. I'm just saying. You know, when you're in the trenches with somebody, you get to know what they're really like. Like when you're building something with somebody and they smash their finger with a hammer out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you get to know what's in there. You know, and and sometimes I don't know about y'all, but when I was first growing in Christ, sometimes stuff came out and I was like, I didn't even know that was still in there. But my Lord, there just all came out. And you'd be embarrassed if you were around the wrong set of friends, right? I mean, if it was just your old ragamuffins, they were like, yeah, get it, boy. But you're at church work day and you hit your thing with a hammer and, and you're like, hallelujah. No, no. Probably didn't happen that way, did it? And you like say something like, "Oh, I ain't said that in a long time since last Tuesday." But you know, (laughs) because to let somebody see authentically who we are. I remember we were building our house, and 
and I was working with my dad, and I, I um, shot the nail gun, and the nail gun missed the wood, went into my thumb, and nailed my thumb to my finger just like that. I mean, it was just boom in there. And um, I mean, I, I just felt the pain as I did that. I can remember it. So, and, and I, I threw it up when I did it. I looked at it and, and I started. I don't know how many of you believe in this or not, but I promise you, if you had done that, you'd have believed in it at that moment. I started hollering in tongues. I'm telling you, I gave a message in tongues in my house. I was hollering and, 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 and my dad reached over and grabbed it and ripped it out just like that. He said, if I let it swell, son, it'll get worse. And I'm thinking, I don't know how this moment could get any worse. I just don't. And I went running out of the house. And we were framing it up so I could run through walls still then. It wasn't a... I went running out into the yard, running around, and I got the interpretation of the tongues out in the yard. I'm out there hollering, hallelujah, Jesus. And one of my dad's workers says, I ain't never heard nobody speak in a foreign language when they hurt themselves like that. <laughs> I was kind of, I was happy on several accounts that not a lot of cuss words came out and that I prayed instead of saying things I shouldn't have. Because sometimes when stuff happens, you find out what's really inside, right? Right. And so it is in that life, that context of life on life. I'll never forget one day I was in Wrightsville laying a floor with uh, my dad. I was laying tile and then, and somebody knocked on the front door. They said, I'm looking for uh, Chad, the preacher guy. And this painter up front, he goes, well, I don't know who the preacher guy is, but there's a guy in there laying tile. He sings all day, and I ain't never heard him curse. He must be the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, good testimony. <laughs> he's singing, and he's not cursing, even when he makes a mistake. You see, it's in the context of life. People get to know who you really are, right? I mean, come on. We show up here on Sunday. How are you doing? Fine. Blessed. You blessed. Good to see you. Blessed. Blessed. See you next week. Blessed. Blessed. Right? You don't know nobody like that. But it's life on life. And the, the Bible says it this way, as iron sharpens iron, so one man gets on another man's nerves. <laughs> that ain't quite how it says it, but that's what, I, that's what I get from it. One man sharpens another because you get to see what people are like when you're with them. But I, if I refuse to let anyone into my life, how can they truly help me or how can they truly ever get to know me? So I have to do my part. I have to do my part to let others in. If I don't, and if I continue to struggle on my own, then what happens is often people who struggle on their own and don't let people in, they create a narrative that says, nobody cares about me. I am alone and nobody is in this with me. But listen to me. You create the world you want. And if you, uh, there's a proverb that says a man who wants friends must show himself friendly. If you create a world of isolation and then you complain about being isolated, you created that world yourself. You cannot create a world of isolation, not letting anybody in, and then kick and moan and complain that nobody is there. If you have scared everybody away, they're away because they're scared. And it's really difficult to push back into a life when someone has said, I don't want you here. It takes a lot. And so we must do our part if we're going to be in discipleship relationships to be in each other's life. That means we cannot have this prison of our own making and then complain that nobody is in it with us. You make your own prison and lock the doors. You're in there alone. Not alone because God is always with you. But I'm just talking people. When you push people away... And then you complain that nobody's there for you. It takes humility to say, I need help. It takes humility to, to be honest and authentic and say, I'm struggling. But I'm telling you, it's only in those places of true, authentic relationship that you can find help to grow beyond it. We need each other. Discipleship cannot be successful if it's fake or forced on us. I, I believe it's best when it's organic. When it naturally flows out of a relationship. You can't just pick somebody like, hey, I'm going to be your best friend. Let's do this thing. It just doesn't. I mean, generally, when somebody rolls up on me like that, I'm like, oh, you didn't take your meds today. <laughs> if you're all of a sudden deciding in one minute we just met and we're going to be best friends, I'm thinking this probably ain't going to last too long. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Come on, y'all, right? Because yeah. something feels very fake, forced, and phony about that. Now, I know some of us make friendships faster than others, but I have found in general, the faster you make friendships, the faster you lose friendships, because those fast made friendships usually aren't very long lasting. 
The fact is, it takes time to build history. I love it. Pastor Melinda has a plaque on her wall that says it takes a long time to build an old friend, doesn't it? Yeah. And I want you to know it takes time to build friendships. It takes time and a whole lot of effort to germinate seeds. It's funny when, um, when we met, we, we didn't fall in love with each other because of, you know, hey, you're cute. Well, she probably said that when she met me, but. <laughs> but it wasn't based on that. I saw her across the field and I heard Holy Spirit say, that's going to be your wife. And I was like, what do I do with this? And he said, you should meet her. And I went and met her. And then a week later, I said, I got to tell you what I heard last week, because if I'm wrong, we need to back this train up. I heard Holy Spirit say, you're going to be my wife. And she said, it's true. And I was like, so you know? And she said, yes, I know. She'd already heard months before the Lord spoke to her heart. And we're like, so this is going to be, so what are we engaged? A week into knowing each other. Yep, I guess we're engaged. We went and said to her mom. And the next day I said to my pastor, I said to my parents, everybody was like, yep, we know. We've been waiting for you to hear it. It's like, y'all knew? Was I like the last one to know? Yep. So there was no feeling like, oh, I'm so in love with her. I'm going to marry her. It was, this is God's will for my life. And so we said to our pastor, this is what we think is supposed to be. He said, yeah, but now I want you to date and get to know each other. Three months in, we both said, I don't want to marry you. Lord Jesus, it was cuter when I didn't know you, you know, when I was like, you know, I just saw you across the field and I was like, oh, yeah. And now I'm like, oh, no, (laughs) because I live alone and I don't want nobody telling me what to do. And I have my own apartment and and I don't know if this is going to work out. And she was like, I don't want to marry him. She left the apartment or or we were having lunch one day and you said you left. I remember you said I was going, I don't want to marry him. And the Lord said, why not? And you said out loud, because I'll have to change. (laughs) And, and it was over the next three months, we didn't get married until six months after we met, that God did a work to bind our hearts together and to help us grow with one another. So from the time we met until we got married on November 22nd, 1986, we met, we met May 31st, November 22nd. And in that season, it was getting to know each other. Now, that was 35 years ago. It took time. It took time. But I would be an idiot to think I know her. I know about her. I know a lot about her. And I have everything in me that I need to keep getting to know her. And so um, discipleship takes time. Building relationships takes time, but it can't be fake or forced. It's, it's organic. It naturally happens. It, it takes a, a level of honesty and a depth of, of relationship that not everyone's willing to go to. Some people are okay with, hey, how are you? Good to see you. But if you want authentic relationship, you're going to have to go deeper. The truth is, if someone doesn't want real relationships, there's not anything you can do to force it on them. Listen, let me speak to wives for a minute. Wives, you will never change your husband. There's not a thing you can do. He already married you. He feels like he won. Why would he want to change? So he's not going to change. You're not going to change him by the things you say. And don't come at that. He's not the man I married. He sure is. You just didn't see it all. It was all there. It was, it was all inside. And now over a period of time, you saw some stuff you didn't like. Right? It's true. And, and husbands, let me say something. You're never going to change your wives. You're not going to change them. The only person in this room who has the hope of changing anybody is you. Changing yourself by submitting to Holy Spirit. By saying, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place. Fill this atmosphere. Come change my mind. Come change my thoughts. Come change what I see. Bring me repentance. Help me walk in what God has called me to be and do. And, but that's on you. And you cannot grow a relationship one-sided. Husbands, wives, you can't change the relationship until each of you decide. In discipleship, 
discipleship relationships. You can't have a one-sided discipleship relationship. If one person won't be honest and open, then what you have is a counseling relationship where you're pouring out everything, but they're never open and honest with you. And I'm telling you something. I know for me, if you won't be honest with me, I'm not going to open up to you. Because if you're just gathering fuel for the fire, and I'm not giving you any more of me. And if you wonder why people don't seem to trust you, you might want to check your own doorstep. If you can't be honest about, because none of us are perfect. All of us have battles. All of us have struggles. All of us have issues. All of us. And it's only in being authentic about who we are, only then can we help one another. It can't be forced. You can't force relationship on anyone. You can't force discipleship. Again, we have to be willing to let others in if it's going to be successful. Now, discipleship is simply intentionally helping someone else grow in Christ. So being in their lives and and helping them, being willing to say the truth to them, being able to help them, being willing to speak to somebody the things you see, being able, willing, as we said, to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and then share that word with others. But the, the fact is, when someone speaks the truth that confronts a lie, you have to be willing to listen to it. But what I find is often when you speak the truth in love, people will deflect it. People will, uh, will, will explain away, they will uh, reject the truth, or, or worse, they'll explain away why they believe the lie. And it usually starts with, well, you don't understand. Yeah. Well, you don't know why I've been through what I've been through, which is your way of saying, I have the right to be ungodly and unscriptural because of what I've been through. The way we accept the truth is by saying, you know, there are times Melinda will say something to me like she's saying, I don't think you're right in this matter. And sometimes all I can say is, I don't understand or see what you see, but I will ask Holy Spirit to show me. Come on. on. I'm not going to deflect it because I don't see it. She'll say, I think you're wrong in this, or I think you shouldn't have said this or shouldn't have done that. And I'll say, I don't know if I agree, but I will ask Holy Spirit to show me. That is humility. And saying, Holy Spirit, please help me see what she sees. I can't see what I can't see. But Holy Spirit can show me what I can't see if I will ask him. And so Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. And listen, speak the truth in love, but speak the truth. We've got to learn to speak the truth to one another and not be afraid of each other's reactions. I'm dropping down to 2 Timothy 2.2 and let me close here. It says, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Look at this. He says, what you've heard from me, these things that I've taught you. He says, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Look at what he's talking about. He's saying, I'm giving you truths. You should pass those truths on. Now, let's go all the way back to the garden for a second. Do you remember in Genesis, Adam and Eve were given a command and the command was, Be fruitful and multiply. Remember, that's what God said to them. Be fruitful and multiply. And I don't know if you've ever stopped to look at this or think about this. Did you know that was not the last time God's people were told to be fruitful and multiply? So Adam and Eve are told that, but they get caught up on their own stuff. And then they lost their commandment to be fruitful and multiply. And then Noah comes along and finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. The earth is wiped away with the flood. Noah and his family come off the boat. And do you know what God said to Noah? Be fruitful and multiply. And Noah messed up real quick. And then it it rolls on for a while. And they end up in slavery. And they come out of Egypt. And God says through Joshua and to Joshua, be fruitful and multiply. Did you know that if you go on down through history, you find that they are in Babylonia in captivity. And they come out. And Jeremiah prophesies over them. And he says to the Israelite people, be fruitful and multiply. And multiply. Do we see a theme with our God under the old covenant? He wanted his people to be fruitful and multiply. He wanted the seed that was in them to reproduce. Not so God could have an army marching through the land with some militants. But so that the earth would be filled with the glory of the Lord. So that what was God relationship, God in relationship with man would be restored. What he desired is for people to know who he really was. 
Go and tell them. Tell the nations of the earth, he says. That is the restoration of the Isaiah 61 mandate, that the earth would know. That, and Paul says it this way. He said, it's as if God is making his appeal through me to let you all know he ain't mad. God's not mad, but he's made peace. Jesus made peace through the blood of the cross. He has made a way for us, and he's not angry with us anymore. And he says, go and let everybody know there's peace. And then Jesus, before he leaves, gives us the great commission that we looked at last week. And what did it say? Go and make disciples. Be fruitful and multiply. The same commandment that was given to Adam and Eve in the beginning, given to Noah, and given all the way through history, be fruitful and multiply, is the commandment we've been given. Be fruitful and multiply, because true disciples make disciples. You hear that? True disciples make disciples. That means we're in each other. That means we're in each other's lives. We're helping each other grow. We're being honest and speaking the truth in love. We're loving people more than we love our own comfort. We love people more than we love our own selves. And we're looking at their needs more than we look at our own needs. And not just counting our needs as most important, but we're caring about others. And now listen, if you refuse to be in a discipleship relationship, you declare you have no need for anyone. You declare, I don't have need for anyone. And that's not the truth. We need each other because together we're stronger. So I just want to ask you, what is Holy Spirit speaking to your heart today about discipleship? Are you being fruitful and multiplying? We started off with this apple. Let's end with this apple. First of all, I want to tell you something. The process of discipleship takes a long time. Some of you need to cut yourself slack. Some of you are are, are getting down on yourself because you're still making mistakes. and You're not getting it right. There's grace and there is mercy. Amen. Amen. Some of you, maybe it didn't germinate as fast as you wanted. Maybe you're like, I don't even know what I believe anymore. Wherever you're at, I want you to know that inside. Now, I want to go back to that first statement I made. In order for what's inside of this to get out, there has to be a brokenness. This apple has to be broken open. And some of us have hated our broken places. But may I suggest to you that your broken places are where the seed of your life is being spilled out. That sometimes the places in your life that you've hated, Paul, remember, asked Jesus to take away the brokenness. And Jesus said, are you kidding? That's where my strength is going to be made perfect. Now, I don't know about you, but I want perfect strength in my life. And I believe it's in those weaknesses, the place. Maybe I'm the only person here who's ever prayed and said, God, if that had never happened to me, man, how strong I would be for you. God, if I didn't have that struggle. God, if I didn't go through that. God, if I didn't have that weakness. God, if I didn't have that diagnosis. God, if I didn't. Boy, what I could be for you. And you can spend the rest of your life wishing and lamenting that you have those things. Or you can say, it's in those things where the enemy said, I will make you a nobody, that he has made me a somebody. And I will allow the brokenness. I won't kick and scream against it anymore. Because through that, he is helping others find strength. Because folks are watching you. Folks are watching you. And, and for some of us, what a testimony of grace that we just haven't given up. Amen. 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 Bow your heads. Father, thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for every walk person in here, every person watching this, for the place they're at in their walk. And we know you love us no matter where we're at in our growth, whether we've just started seeking or we've been with you for a while. We know this, you have never left us nor forsaken us, and we've never been separated from you. Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in us. I thank you for your life inside of us. And I'm just asking, Holy Spirit, that you teach us as a church how to be fruitful and multiply how we help others in in practical ways know that our Father is a loving Heavenly Father. Help us, Lord. Help us. Holy Spirit, speak to each heart right now. What is it you require of us? What is it you're speaking to us? What is you're asking of us? In Jesus' name.